Well, it's my job today to talk very quickly because I know you want to ask some questions at the end. I also try and get this the right way up. I might skip through some of the slides, therefore, because we've heard some of the topics already. But if anything, the main emphasis is very much about countering pessimism, countering stereotypes. We all have stereotypes of so many different things, and certainly in terms of economy, I'm sure many of us are rather pessimistic about the increasing numbers of old people. So let's have a look at these issues. How do you view older people? Some of you probably are older yourselves by the looks of you, or am I being prejudiced? Elderly, a word in English that has connotations of infirmity and disability. I've been taken to task by a, a, an activist who was herself, I think, 73 years old, for using this word, so I've stopped using it. Maybe you see people as wrinklies. Now, I don't know how some of these terms translate into either German or Chinese, so you'll have to come up with your own uh, versions, if you like. Coffin dodgers. <laughs> Past it. Infirm. Ill. Dependent. A drain on society. Mm. Well, let's hope you don't think this way, but many people do. Maybe you see the elderly as being essentially disabled in wheelchairs. But even if you do, that would be a disabled conception. Or perhaps you see them as living a rather idyllic life. They've done their 40 years, and what do they get at the end of it? A clock. A clock? That's rubbing it in, isn't it? Hopefully, you don't see the elderly in quite that way. Oh, sorry, older people. Countering stereotypes. Maybe it should be about seniors. Experientially advantaged. You know the singer Tom Jones, any of you? Yes? No? Delilah. I am singing about it, I haven't got the time. He said he brings three things to this program, The Voice. Three things were experience, experience, experience. And he's 72. The active elderly. It's very important increasingly to try and encourage older people to remain or even become, if they haven't been, active. And this can be done in a whole range of ways. There is even a program nowadays where you can sit down and still be active. Even if you've, you're bound to your chair, you can still be active. You can move your arms and keep your body motion at the top half, even if the bottom half is, is restricted. Or older people could be vulnerable. Professor Cruz referred quite often to that term, vulnerability. And certainly, I don't want to uh, demean the idea that old people can be vulnerable. But old people may also be carers themselves. One of the outcomes of the single child family policy in China is, of course, that older people, the grandparents, are often the ones who look after the grandchildren. And especially in South Africa, because of the HIV and AIDS crisis, which was wiped out a whole middle generation, older people are often the carers, again, of the grandchildren. Or, of course, they may be victims. So, you know, there are different things coming into play here. Hopefully, older people will be valued and respected, to be appreciated for what they know or what they've come through. Still dancing after all these years. Or, more dramatically, whoo, <laughs> Chinese one. This is from the web, I've got my own pictures, but I haven't had time to put them in. And Tai Chi has recently been recognized in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Even gentle Tai Chi, Tai Chi Quan, 
as, as having tremendous benefits to, to older people, to older bodies. And of course, those of you who visit China regularly and get up early enough in the morning, you'll see all sorts of active aging going on uh, in the parks and open spaces. <coughs> We've just had a little bit about Confucianism. So it's a Confucius Institute, so here's a Confucian type quote. And the mixed love, fear and awe of the children for their father was strengthened by the great respect paid to age. An old man's loss of vigour was more than offset by his growth of wisdom. Aging is a global phenomenon. Now here's a few facts and figures, I'm not going to dwell on them, but it just shows the expansion in, say, the United States. Italy and Japan are the highest percentage older people at the moment, or maybe, we'll see you in a minute. One in ten Japanese will be 85 or over by 2030. And of course, as we've already heard for China, developing countries have the highest rates of growth. Singapore, Malaysia, Colombia, Costa Rica, and so on. We'll see elderly numbers, numbers triple. So in the book that uh, Petra has summarized so eloquently, um, we looked at aging in seven different countries. So here's a table that shows the aging in five of the countries, because the other two don't even make the cutoff that was used in this particular source. So if you see at the bottom, 10% and 1 million cutoff, which excludes the Germany lot listed. Okay, let's have a look at this table, because it's very interesting indeed. Um, the, the first column, uh, in 1950, only two countries in that table. That's 10% and more than 1 million older, older people. United Kingdom, fourth, Sweden was eighth. Sweden comes up to first by 1975. UK goes down to fourth. By 2000, Japan comes in at fourth. United States, 33rd, 33rd in the, the list. Japan is first by 2025, according to projections. And China comes in for the first time. This is the percentage uh, at 51st. And then by 2050, Japan is second, outstripped only by Spain, and UK has slipped to 28th, China is up to 44. We didn't look at Germany, um, but we brought, but if you bring that in, for 1950, no, there we go, Germany's not listed, not, not even West and East take together, but by 1975, Germany was third in that list, seventh by 2000, sixth by 25, and ninth by um, 2050. But look at the percentages, how they're increasing, but the country slips down the rankings because so many other countries are coming in at a higher level. So this next table, this is the numbers game, and Professor Chen referred to it for China, uh, incredibly dramatic figures. So in 1950, China, in terms of numbers of older people, this is over 65, this list. Five million is a cutoff. China was first, and of course has remained first all the way through. Even when it had a low percentage of older people, um, it was still first in terms of overall numbers. The United States is there, second, then third, 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 and third. The United States is a very interesting country to study because although it has a high percentage of number of older people, it also has a, quite a high number of younger people. It's a bit unusual in that respect. And partly that's because of the immigration of Hispanics into the United States. But their, their high fertility levels and high, high production of, um, of children. But interestingly, they're also outliving white people in the United States increasingly for whatever reason, whether it's diet, faith, spirituality, who knows. And then again, let's bring Germany into the equation. So in terms of absolute numbers, in 1950, Germany was uh, fourth, then fifth, sixth, eighth, 
by the 11th. So tremendous numbers involved. And if you read the, the tables in terms of worry and pessimism, then you can't be worried about some of these numbers. But one of the things about aging is it does, as my mum used to say, my late mother, aging doesn't come by itself. Well, although she was Scottish, so she said, aging doesn't come by itself. Now, in terms of aging, it interweaves with so many other variables. Race and ethnicity is one. I'll just refer to Hispanics having a higher lifespan, longevity level, than white people in the United States. That's quite unusual because often ethnic minority groups in different countries have a lower level of longevity. Then, of course, there are tremendous variations in income and wealth among older people. Income tends to drop as you get older, as you retire, but your wealth may have increased. There's a, a paradox here because, of course, it goes into savings. And one of the things at the moment, with low interest rates around the globe, that is not very helpful for those of us who are reliant on savings. Then there's a link to gender. Who lives longest in most societies? It is, of course, females. But not in all societies. Some societies, like um, Afghanistan, I think, for instance, and until recently, Nepal, were, were two of the examples where females were not living as long as males because they were in a highly patriarchal situation where, as I said to last night, the, the, the women would eat last after the whole family. Then there's the location aspect. There are elderly people, some people seem to live longer in particular locations in, in, in and around the globe. Some, some of you who are older may spend some of the winter months, for instance, in the Mediterranean. And that's quite a common thing, increasingly common um, half and half migration, going away to warmer climates during the winter. Come from a large country like China, you can go down to Hainan Island or go down to the south. Lifestyle is highly variable among older people. The life course itself is changing. It seems that older people are more active now than the previous generation, than, than my parents were, for a longer time. More disgraceful sometimes, as we'll find out in a moment. Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones is still leaping about, and he's in his 70s. My wife wants to go to see one of the final concerts, but he'll probably have a few final concerts before he <laughs> leaps off the stage. There's a whole spectrum between the active and vulnerable elderly, older people. Oops. Um, <coughs> some older people, I mean, you read about them all the time. They've just completed a marathon. They've just climbed Mount Everest. They've just, uh, oh, nearly crossed across the South Pole, but you had to give up again. Um, but people are, are doing all sorts of things at an older age. But at the other end, yes, especially when you get a stroke or dementia hits or um, you have chronic heart disease, then you can be vulnerable, or if your spouse dies. There's also the wellness illness spectrum, which one commentator has referred to in the past, linked into that. I've also added at the bottom of this page the goodness-badness spectrum. We may think of older people as wonderful old people, but sadly, that is not necessarily the case. Um, in Japan, for instance, they, they recently referred to the busu erosion, the elderly out of control. And what's happening there, it seems, and it's, it's, happened in, it's happening in the UK as well, some old people are excluded from the wealth of the majority. So they're going out committing crime, uh, mugging, would you believe, at night point, in order to get some of these resources that they feel they should be entitled to. There was an example locally where I come from recently, where a 73-year-old man took, uh, I think it was an iPhone from a toddler who was in a wheelchair in a supermarket, but she'd been given the the, the phone by her mother to amuse herself while her mother go on with the shopping. And this 73-year-old man took the, the, the iPhone and 
bit of runner, presumably at a rather slow pace, but that's maybe I'm assuming that. <laughs> so aging interweaves with so many variables. But if look look at this table, it, it, honestly, I haven't made up these figures. It's it's from official government sources in South Africa. Look at the contrast. It, 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 it's it's a, it's it's perfect in the sense of the, the showing the differential by ethnicity. So the percentage of 60 to 74 year olds among African males only 4%, over 75, 0.9. African females is more, colored males, colored and Asian, that's a particular category that is used in South Africa. You might not think that's appropriate, politically correct. Goes up through Indian, Asian, and then white males and white females at the top. And, if, and this one is almost exactly the same, except colored females and Indian Asian males are similar, and uh, this one is, is slightly less. So this contrast by ethnicity. In China, we've heard enough about, but one of the key things I'm interested in, I suppose, as an urbanist, is that there's a high urban and Gold Coast concentration. And Shanghai, that we might see as such a young, booming city, is a city of the ancient. It has been for, for a few years, although the official figures seem to vary a little. Now, how am I doing for time? Okay, more or less. The older people in China, we've all, I think we've had enough of the statistics there, highly spatial and even. Now, the, the figures I saw at this particular time were that 15.4% um, of the population of Shanghai was in category of older. But that contrast, though it's similar to Beijing, Changjin, and maybe Chongqing, a bit of an issue over the, the statistics, and also Jiangsu province. At least double the end of the 21st century. Concerns about economic dependency linked to the single child, child family program. We've heard enough about that, really. But the point I want to make here is that we've got to be careful about dependency rates, because people talk about the older people all being dependent. And that's not necessarily the case, is it? Because some older people will be, but some won't be. And in any case, dependency is also about numbers of children, which are, of course, fewer because of the result of the single child family program. So there was a figure I saw the other day when I was looking through um, <laughs> my book, which reminded me, that um, in 1870, the dependency levels in the United States were greater than they are now because a higher number of children was being born at that time. I've also argued myself and Jason Powell um, against the biomedical model because we feel there's a danger that it overemphasizes invasive methods of dealing with the older body. The older body, in effect, those of us who are older surrender ourselves to the experts who will poke and prod us at will and inject us with all sorts of things and replace bits of us as they fall off and so on. So the, the idea is that we need to look at increasing that aging as a social construct. Why is it so important when someone becomes 60 or 65 or 75 or whatever age that that is so important? When they might be rich, or poor, female, or male, Han, or non-Han, and so on and so forth. You know, there's a lot, a lot more to it, if you like. And we need a minimum to differentiate between the active elderly and the vulnerable elderly. I'll skip all this bit, but basically you can see that in the, locally, where I come from, older people live longer in wealthier areas. No surprise there, but I'm sure you've come up with your own examples. Standardized mortality rates are uh, um, higher than the regional average in Liverpool, in contrast to safety, where wealth is higher. And differences, again, between male and female. So Sefton is to the north of Liverpool, a wealthier area, and the data is a little bit old now, but um, still see contrast within it. So in other words, a lot of data to, to consider. 
But if you look at Liverpool as a whole, you see that specific wards um, have higher proportions of older people within them. There's often a link with long-term ill, but it's not necessarily coming out. Um, and maybe that's an assumption we need to overcome. So these are from my colleagues, uh, Dr. Giles Barrett and his, his team. Respondents, this is in a relatively poor area of Liverpool, Speak Garston, um, 107, people, 107 older people interviewed, and it refers back to what Professor Cruz was talking about in terms of the intergenerational aspects, because the respondents, one of the things they, they, they wanted was more adventurous provision and greater consultation by providers, but they were also rather worried about um, young people threatening them, if you like, or they felt threatened. So more of them would spend too much time at home not going out enough because they were worried about um, crime and antisocial behaviour. So there's a need to educate. And of course there's a need to theorise. Uh, Jason Powell um, has, has argued that so social gerontology is data rich but theory, power, theory poor. So these are some of the theories up here that we, we could follow if we're interested um, in, in those directions. Jason himself is more of a Foucauldian. He sees things in terms of master narratives and discourse. I support a lot of that, but I, I also see that there are certain realities of inequalities that we need to consider. What are the key questions then? That's something you might like to think about. Um, are, are the elderly, oops, again, older people, a social challenge for the city, because often it's an urban phenomenon, and the state? What are the implications for social policy? What about the rise of great power? You know, my generation is of the 60s. If I was in my teens in the 60s. The 60s were such a tremendous change in society. Do minority cultures look after the, the elderly better, older people better, or do they not? Is it, is it a mythology that, that say, gastrovitis would look after the older people in a better way or not? Is it a pensions crisis? How does the credit crunch in the age of austerity that we're in just now affect older people? What should be the responsibilities of the young towards older people? Can these be codified via filial piety or legislated for by law? I think many of us would find the Chinese legislation a little, a little bit draconian, perhaps, to say the least. And what about biotechnology and nanotechnology? Who would be in future injected with chips that record all our lives and save us having to think altogether? So what do you think of it so far? There is some references on further reading. But if you want those, I'm sure Petra or, or, or myself would send them. What do you think of it so far? Oh, in, in, <laughs> the end.